we are ready to get started with our tour of the universe. Thank you, everybody, for checking in. I really appreciate that. I'm going to turn things over to Mitch and Naomi. Uh, Naomi is going to share her screen with us, and we're going to be able to fly around the universe. I see Mitch is doing his astronaut thing. <laughs> and uh, there we go. I'll let them take it away. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to space. And we're looking down at uh, really the nicest planet to live on if you're a human in our solar system, which is the planet Earth. Um, it's got all of the right conditions that make it possible. It, a lot of planets, it wouldn't even be possible to make a milkshake. And if you brought a milkshake to Mars, for example, you'd have to drink it really fast because it would very quickly evaporate. So Earth is the best place for milkshakes and human life. Um, and today we're gonna tour around the parts of the solar system and check out some cool stuff in space. And if you have any questions that come up, throw them in the chat and our moderator, Jose, uh, will be keeping an eye on that. And he'll pass some of them to me. He'll try to answer other ones and uh, keep on top of that, right? And then Naomi, of course, will be flying us safely throughout the galaxy. She's very skilled at Starship piloting. Highly, highly certified by some interplanetary organization, I'm sure, yeah. And uh, so this is the Earth where we've been looking up at the stars. And by we, I mean humans, since there were humans. For thousands of years, we've been looking up and observing and trying to figure out what's going on up there. And in the past several hundred years, uh, we've accelerated with what we've been able to find. We've come up with telescopes, then we had bigger telescopes. Eventually, we actually had spaceships. Um, and every new technology we build, the more we're able to find out about the solar system. Um, and we found out so many amazing things. And uh, yeah. So Let's share some of those amazing things with you today. Sure. Of in course. This, yeah, in this program, we are going to be using polls. So you can uh, just click and vote in these polls. And these are going to be places that we're going to see. We've chosen for our polls places that don't normally get picked in demonstrations like this. I love Saturn too, Naomi. It's one of my favorites, and lots of people do. And that means we end up spending a lot of time in Saturn in programs like this. So we wanted to go to some locations that don't get as much love or attention. Uh, so our first poll is going to pop up right now about what, what you want to go to, what you want to see. What planet would you like to visit? Mercury, Venus, Uranus, or Neptune? Fun. Yeah, so... Go ahead and click your option and then hit submit. The two closest and the two farthest away planets <laughs> from the sun. Two hottest and two coldest. Oh, hottest and coldest, yeah. Oh, oh this the, the pairing. <laughs> We're gonna leave that poll open for about 15 more seconds. All right, all right. And this, this is your chance to campaign, Mitch. If you're gonna try and sway people, this is your chance. You got 10 seconds left in the poll. <laughs> ah, well, we could go to Earth's evil twin. We could go to the morning star. We could go to the planet George. Uh, all of these are different names for some of these objects. Um, I don't know another name for Neptune. Oh, Planet X. Neptune was originally called Planet X when we thought that there was a planet out there, but no one could find it for a little while. It was the mysterious Planet X. Um, then we found it. Well, oh, that's the one we're going to learn more about. Our poll has closed, and it looks like Neptune wins with 41%. All right. Well, let's fly out to Neptune. Now, Neptune, as I mentioned, was Planet X. Neptune is the first planet ever discovered by math. Uh, astronomers noticed that the orbit of Uranus wasn't quite what they would expect, and they tried to figure out what could explain that. And one thing that could explain it is there was another planet out there even farther away from the sun than Uranus. And they did the math, they figured out where it should be, they pointed our telescopes up there, and we found it. So Neptune, discovered by math. And it's pretty exciting that we can go out to Neptune. We have only ever sent one spaceship anywhere near Neptune, and that was Voyager 2. And it flew by in the late 80s, so, wow, like 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, was the last time we got any really good photographs of the beautiful blue planet Neptune. Um, and remember, if you have 
things you're curious about Neptune, uh, throw them in the chat. Neptune. Yep, I'll, I'll watch out for those questions. Don't worry. Excellent. Thank you. Can I share my favorite Neptune fact? Yeah. Okay. So if you can get to Neptune, I will guarantee you, you are the richest person I know because there's so much heat and pressure on the inside of Neptune that carbon gets compressed down to diamonds. So we likely think, well, likely we think we would find raining diamonds down near the center of Neptune and maybe even diamond icebergs on this weird carbon ocean. That would be one heck of a piece of jewelry, a diamond from Neptune. <laughs> I see a lot of questions in the chat asking why Neptune is blue. Oh yes, why is Neptune blue? Uh, Neptune, by the way, is named after the Roman god of the sea, and that's because look how beautiful and blue it is, just like the deep ocean. Um, but it is not blue for the same reason as the ocean. Um, Neptune is blue because though it is mostly made up, if it's a gas giant, it's mostly made up of gas, like hydrogen and helium, like 98, 99% hydrogen and helium, but the upper layers have a lot of a gas called methane. And methane is a gas that we have on Earth. If you have a gas stove, it probably uses methane. We call it natural gas. <clears throat> you can also find it in cow flatulence um, and also cow belching. There was a recent study. Most of the methane cows produce is actually from belching. But anyways, this methane gas absorbs the red and yellow wavelengths of light. So the sunlight that hits methane, uh, sorry, that hits Neptune contains all the colors of the rainbow, and that gas absorbs the red and yellow wavelengths and reflects back the blue. So we see the blue light reflected off of Neptune, and that's why it's blue. I saw a question in the chat too that is, you know, natural gas here on Earth is smelly, so somebody wanted to know if Neptune was smelly, but actually uh, we add that smell to natural gas because it's dangerous and we want people to know that it's there. So Neptune is not smelly, it is not a stinky. Uh, That's true. Uh, Methane by itself doesn't, it's not a smell that humans really can detect. Um, but cow is also smelly because cows also add something uh, to the methane that they release. Um, we have lots of questions in the chat asking what that dark spot is. On oh too. yeah. So that, so astronomers are very clever when it comes to naming things. And so we call that the great dark spot. Um, and what it is, is methane is a gas giant. So what we're looking at is mostly clouds. There's not a surface that you can see that you could stand on. If you tried to stand on Neptune, it'd be just like trying to stand on a cloud on Earth. You would just fall right through it. Um, and so among those clouds, there's a lot of uh, movement. And that dark spot is a huge hurricane. And Neptune actually has the fastest wind speeds we've ever recorded anywhere in the solar system. Um, wind speeds up to and maybe even beyond 800 miles an hour. So that is a huge spinning hurricane. But it's disappeared. So this was there when uh, we observed it with the Voyager spacecraft. Hubble has since tried to observe it. It disappeared and then little storms seem to come back. So they're not these crazy long lasting hurricanes like on Jupiter. So we, you would see lots of changing weather on Neptune if you were there collecting diamonds. I have some questions here in the chat too about what the temperature is on Neptune. Neptune. So Neptune, uh, I mentioned it doesn't have a surface you could stand on. And when we measure the, the temperature of a planet, we usually talk about the surface temperature, which on Earth, it's easy to tell where the surface is, because that's where you stop falling towards the center. On Neptune, that's harder to say. So we define the surface as the place inside of Neptune where the pressure of all the gases is about the same as sea level on Earth. Um, and at that point, Neptune is very cold. And Naomi, would you like to tell us how cold? It is about negative 353 degrees Fahrenheit. So very, very cold out there. Not much sunlight reaching it at all. But then the deeper you go into Neptune, the hotter it gets. So the center of Neptune would be very, very hot, probably tens of thousands of degrees. Do you have that number at your fingertips, Naomi? <laughs> I don't because we actually don't know a ton about the core. We don't know exactly how much pressure and how much how hot it is there. We have approximate guesses that it is obviously much hotter than the surface. Um, and I see there is a question too in the chat about whether it has a solid core or not. We don't know. That's one of the really exciting That's things about magnetic. Gas magnetic. What was That's that? That's right. We don't. We don't know. It does have a magnetic field, which suggests that there might be 
uh, metallic hydrogen or nickel iron core to the planet to make that magnetic field. Hopefully. We'll find and out. You might have a diamond core, like we talked about. Somebody asked if you could stand on the diamonds. We don't know. Oh. We don't know how big they are or, you know, I hope we think they're there. That would be very cool, but we don't know. Maybe we could, maybe we couldn't. However, oh, if you get down into Neptune where the diamonds are, it would be the amount of pressure that it compresses the diamonds that you too would probably be crushed into a tiny little diamond. Um. We are made out of a lot of carbon. That's true. I, I see another question in the chat here uh, from Nicole that says, how can it be so hot if it's so far away from the sun? Yeah, great question. So the surface is cold because it is so far away from the sun. It's not getting energy from the sun. But when Neptune formed, uh, the process of forming of the material gathering together was very, very hot. Uh, all of the planets when they first formed, like when Earth first formed, it was really a big ball of lava. And then the outer layers cooled off. And the inside of the Earth is still incredibly hot, regardless of how much sunlight is hitting it. And so that's true of Neptune too, is the center is still incredibly hot from the formation and because it is so massive, gravity is pulling everything towards the center. So there's an incredible amount of pressure in the center of Neptune. Um, and something that physicists have discovered a long time ago is that if you take a material and you increase the pressure, the temperature increases as well. I see lots of uh, questions in the chat about how long it takes to fly to Neptune and then how long it takes Neptune to go around the sun. So the one time we flew to Neptune, which was the Voyager 2 spacecraft, um, it I want about, let's see, I think it passed by Neptune in about 1988, and it left Earth in 1977, so it took about 11 years. 12 um, years, you're close. 12 years, ha <laughs> ha. Uh, um, so, <laughs> uh, so that was a long time ago. We've made a lot of changes in spacecraft, but it might be more efficient to not go directly there. It might be more efficient to swing around Jupiter a couple times and then head out. Um, but 12 years last time we went. And then to go around the sun, Naomi, do you have that number at your fingertips? Oh, I do have that number at my fingertips. Uh, to go around the sun is about 165 years. 165 so years. We so would just be convinced <laughs> on Neptune. Uh, if I were uh, born on Neptune, I would be uh, approximately 1 50th of a year old. So. <laughs> I see a question here in the chat that says, uh, are there moons or rings around Neptune? There are moons and rings around Neptune. Um, and so these little purple lines you're seeing are the moons of Neptune. The rings are there, but they're, they're small and thin and mostly made out of rocks, so they're hard to see. Um, but all these purple lines are moons of Neptune. And what is the naming strategy of Neptunian moons? They're named for the mythologi mythological children of Neptune. So they have uh, names like um, Calypso. Uh, and one of the most famous moons of Neptune is Triton, which if you've seen The Little Mermaid, that's Ariel's dad's name. Um, and Triton is actually a really interesting moon because it orbits the opposite direction of all of Neptune's other moons. So we think that Triton was actually an object that flew too close to Neptune and got captured by its gravity and then became a moon. Triton is also really interesting because it has geysers on it filled with liquid nitrogen. Well, it's liquid nitrogen should we move on to a moon looking at the time? Let's move yes, on to I, a moon. That's a great segue. We're going to move on to our next destination. So another one of those poles is going to pop up in front of you. And this one says, which moon would you like to visit? Phobos, which is a moon of Mars, Io or Europa, which are moons of Jupiter, or Titan, which is a moon of Saturn. So go ahead and click the one you like, and we'll leave this poll up for a little bit. While the poll's up, I'm gonna answer a few last questions in the chat. And uh, I see- uh, Our super cool places. How many about how many moons uh, Neptune has, we are not sure. Some of Neptune's moons might be really hard for us to see with our telescopes right now. I also saw somebody was surprised that we haven't visited Neptune in more than 30 years, but 
Actually, one of the reasons for that is because Neptune is so far away and it takes so long for spacecraft to get there. And spacecraft are very, very expensive. So what we usually do is we study Jupiter. Jupiter is the biggest gas giant, but it's also the one that's relatively closest to us. It only takes about five years to get to Jupiter. And we think that what we learn about Jupiter can help us understand Neptune. And one of the reasons we visited Neptune when we did was one of the reasons the Voyager spacecraft, they really needed to launch in 1977 because all of the planets were aligned in just the right way that with one spaceship, we could fly by Uranus and Neptune. And that is a very, that happens once every hundred years or so. So it was a really amazing opportunity to be able to fly by both of those distant objects. And these yellow lines you see on your screen are the path of the Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft um, that were the first things we ever launched that were fast enough to actually get out of our solar system, to actually go out into interstellar space uh, between solar systems. And they're still working, which is really cool. They're still working and we're still in touch with them. And what's amazing is that they were built in 1977 and computers were totally different in 1977. And actually the computing power of the Voyager 2 spacecraft is less than a tiny object you probably have in your house. And I don't mean your cell phone. If you have a key fob that unlocks your car, that is a more powerful computer than the computer on the Voyager 2 spacecraft. Which That's is pretty crazy. All right, we've uh, completed that poll. So here are our results. It looks like Saturn's moon Titan has won with 49% of the votes. So let's fly off to that moon of Saturn. And Titan is a very cool moon. And there's an upcoming uh, NASA mission to Titan, um, which I always get the name wrong. It's either Dragonfly or Firefly or... Uh, <laughs> I think it's Dragonfly. Dragonfly. Horse, horsefly, maybe, Horsefly. <laughs> So Titan is a fascinating uh, space in our universe because it is the only other place in the universe besides Earth that has solid, that has uh, liquid on the surface. It's got lakes and rivers. It has clouds and it rains there. But all of this liquid is not water like it is on Earth because on Titan, your average surface temperature is about negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit. So there is water there, but that water is frozen incredibly solid. But methane, like we had in the upper atmosphere of Neptune, reflecting back all that blue light, um, at these temperatures on Titan is actually a liquid. So there are lakes of liquid methane, and there's rainstorms of methane raindrops. Um, and what's exciting is we're always looking for water out in space, because the one place where there's water in our solar system, the planet Earth, is covered in life. And so maybe we need water for life in our universe, First, maybe we just need that liquid cycle of lakes evaporating and forming clouds and raining back down. So this is a really interesting place to look to see what might be going on. I see a lot of people asking why Titan looks red or orange. Okay, so I, this is a question that bothered me for a long time. Because you remember how Neptune was blue because of the methane in the atmosphere? Well, Titan is orange because of the methane in the atmosphere. Um, <laughs> Which I will which also is point out that the view we have is a little bit weird here because this isn't what we would see if we approached Titan on a spacecraft. It would just be a ball of orange. Um, yeah. you, it's looking a little bit redder, I think, than normal in this visualization because what we're allowing us to do in the planetarium is look through those clouds and actually be able to see some of the lakes, which are a very dark black color. So I think that's why we're seeing red more than orange. Yeah. So the big difference is on Titan, that gas is reflecting back blue light on, uh, sorry, on Neptune. On Titan, something very different is happening. The high energy particles from the sun, we call those solar wind, uh, but the sunlight is interacting with the methane in the atmosphere and is actually breaking it apart. And when that happens, it actually releases kind of an orange smoke, sort of a byproduct of orange stuff. Um, so the atmosphere around uh, Titan is full of kind of orange smoky stuff. I have a question here too that says, how did water uh, get on Titan? How did the methane get there? How do moons form? A great question. And one that uh, even the sharpest minds of planetary science are still trying to figure out completely. But basically, uh, before you have a planet or a solar system or a star, you have a big cloud of gas and dust. And then over 
hundreds and millions and billions of years, those clouds start to pull together. And the bigger an object gets, the more gravity it has, so it attracts more stuff to it. And when it gets big enough, um, and every time it attracts more stuff, it gets more energy. So it also gets really hot. Um, so when you get a big enough hot ball of stuff, it will become a moon. <laughs> That's the very basic version. And, you know, some moons, too, don't necessarily form with their planets. They might form somewhere else in the solar system and get a little too close to their planets and be captured. And they might have been asteroids before. That's certainly the case with Phobos around Mars. Um, and even a little second moon we have at the moment that'll only be our moon for a few years before it moves on. It's, it's teeny tiny, way far away, but we've captured it with our gravity. I see a question here that says, why is methane so common in our solar system? Why do we find methane all over the place? Yeah, so um, we actually find the same basic elements. So far, we haven't found any elements out in space that we don't also find at Earth. And the most common elements on Earth tend to be the most common out in space. Um, and methane is very significant in these objects we looked at, but it's not actually that like in Neptune, the methane is less than 1% of the composition of Neptune. It just happens to be on the surface, so it affects the way that we see it. Um, but everything in the universe was formed inside of a star. And the most, well, except for hydrogen and possibly a few other things. Um, but for the most part, everything was formed inside of a star. Um, and so smaller stars will form certain elements. Really big stars are needed to form uh, elements farther down on the periodic table. So things like gold, for example, are much more rare than things like methane and oxygen and uh, stuff like that. It also has to do with, yeah, that, that cloud of gas and dust that we all form from. And as that was forming, lots of chemical reactions were happening to change what was there left over from all the cool star stuff. And methane is actually a really common element for us to form in that, that primordial soup that we all came from. Yes, methane is the simplest hydrocarbon, which is materials that are made out of hydrogen and carbon. Methane is a single carbon atom with four hydrogen atoms stuck to it. Um, we got another question here about, aside from the methane, what are the other things that Titan is made out of? What other elements are there? Yeah, so <clears throat> we're pretty sure that the rocky Underneath this atmosphere, you do have a rocky planet, kind of like Earth, that we think is probably mostly formed out of rock with a, an iron core. Um, we've got mountains of ice, of frozen water, uh, lakes of methane. The atmosphere is a lot of methane, but also a little bit of oxygen, some carbon dioxide. Um, mostly nitrogen. Mostly mm -hmm. nitrogen, just like the atmosphere on Earth. Our air is about 80% or so nitrogen, um, <clears throat> and so, in a lot of ways, Titan is kind of similar to Earth, except for being very, very cold. And I'll also point out on the surface, too, we have a very solid surface on Titan, and it's made out of what seems like a rocky material, but it's actually water ice that's frozen so solidly that it acts like rock. When you're below 300 degrees Fahrenheit, things get a little bit crazy. So uh, we actually have water ice acting like rock on Titan. How hot is the surface of Titan? So average temperature is about negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit. So extremely cold. And one other thing we have to mention with Titan is the reason the atmosphere is so, like when you look at Titan from space or with the telescope, you will just see an orange ball. And that's because that atmosphere is really, really thick. And it's so thick that if you got a pair of wings and put them on your arms, you would be able to flap and you'd be able to fly through the air on Titan. I don't know. I'm still personally trying to sell this as the next hot vacation spot or cold vacation spot. You've got beachfront <laughs> property that's super abundant. The liquid methane and ethane lakes are really, really dense so, and there's low gravity. So you could do cool jumps like dolphins. You could go gliding. I think this is a great place for vacation. Just need a lot of time to get there. I've seen a couple people ask, why does, how did Titan get its name Titan? Why do we call oh. it Titan? So the moons around Saturn are named after the Titans, right, Jose? Yeah, because Saturn, <clears throat> I'll let Jose take this one. <laughs> <laughs> Saturn, uh, I, Saturn is Jupiter's dad. Uh, uh, in the Greek equivalent, where Jupiter is Zeus, Saturn would be Kronos, which is the king of the Titans, who ruled the land before 
Zeus did, or Saturn ruled the land before Jupiter did. So Saturn, uh, all of Saturn's moons are named after Titans from Greek mythology. This one is just called Titan, but it has other moons called Prometheus, Atlas, things like that. And I see a question here that says, does that mean that Greece named it? And that's a really good question. The people in ancient Greece wouldn't have known that Titan was there because you can only see Titan with a telescope. You can't see it with your eyeballs. And so since they didn't have telescopes in ancient Greece or ancient Rome, they wouldn't have named this moon. These moons uh, were discovered, most of them were discovered and named at a time in history when people in science were like, man, Romans, they were just the best. We're gonna have everything have a Latin name. So that's why a lot of things in medicine and science have Latin names. And that's why a lot of the moons around these planets have Latin names because when they were first being discovered in the early days of uh, telescopic astronomy, um, those scientists were like, man, the Romans are just the best. Um, so that's why Neptune ended up with a Roman name and why so many of the moons have Roman names as well. And it's important to point out that the things that you can see without a telescope had different names all over the world. We've been looking up at Jupiter and Saturn and the moon and everything for thousands of years and people all over the world gave different names. There's lots of different versions of constellations and uh, the pictures that people draw in the sky. And there was a time about 150 years ago when just a bunch of people in Europe got together and decided they were just gonna make all of the names standard so that everyone could talk about it. But <clears throat> there are a lot of other valid names for all these objects. Well, and now in science, we, are, we often name things differently now um, because now in science, we recognize that the names that other people had for these objects uh, is just as important as the names that we've given them. So as we discover new objects in our solar system and in our universe, we don't just use Roman or Greek names anymore. Now we are starting to use lots of different names from lots of different cultures and peoples. In fact, someone, a couple of people asked in the chat uh, what the name of our captured little asteroid moon on Earth was, and that has a Hawaiian name, which I will not try to butcher here. So um, I can type it for you all, but don't want to try that pronunciation. But we do uh, name things after other cultures now, which is really exciting. Starting with Saturn, because we're actually running out of Titans to name moons after, so. And Saturn has a lot of 20 more moons. Yeah, <laughs> Saturn. we found over 90 of them. Um, so uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to our next destination. We're going to pull up that next poll question right now. Um, which mysterious distant object would you like to see? These are objects outside of our solar system. Um, a planetary nebula, which is actually a dying star, a pulsar, which is the leftovers of an exploded star, or a baby star, a protostar, a star that has just started shining uh, and, and just started its journey through the universe. So go ahead and click the one you'd like to see, and we'll uh, take a few, a uh, little while to get those poll results. I saw a question early on in the chat that says, um, what those line asks what those lines are on Titan. Why do we see those weird lines? So those are uh, not really there. That's a, a product of the way that we've put together this image. Um, the, the sort of clouds and stuff that you see on the surface are images of what's beneath the clouds. Um, so combining the images where you don't see anything, that's where we don't have images of what's underneath the cloud. Um, so those are an artifact of how we've put together all the pictures. Everything you see in here, including our picture of Earth, is really probably hundreds, maybe thousands of pictures of Earth stitched together to create that complete 3D model. Um, but on Earth, we have so many pictures, we can make it look seamless. On Titan, we don't have as many pictures of the whole, of every area of the surface. All right, it looks like we got those votes, so we're gonna post those results right now. And a Baby star eked out a win with 39%. Oh. That was a really close one. Wow. Uh, but we'll go look at this proto star. Nice. Damn. All right. It'll take us a bit to get out of our solar system, but we'll get there. Pretty I was going to say, speaking of naming things, what's this star called, Naomi? The sun? <laughs> oh, our proto star. Oh, my goodness. You're going to hang on. Let me get its official <laughs> name. <clears throat> it's a, a very exciting name uh, here. Let me see where our protostar is. 
Momentarily, you all chat while I pull up its name and, and get us there. So when I we initially- oh, well, Go ahead. But, I have, I see a great question in the chat that says, if Neptune and Titan are really cold and really far away from the sun, why is there still light there? Why, why are they lit up? So there is significantly less light. We've made them appear brighter in this program so you can see them. Um, but uh, once you get to Mars, which is about roughly 50 million miles farther away from the sun than we are, you get about half as much sunlight. By the time you get out to Saturn, it's about 1 25th of the sunlight that we get. So way out at Uranus and Neptune, it would actually be pretty dark. And if you looked back at the sun, it would be a pretty, it'd be brighter than all the other stars, but it would not look at all as bright as the sun from Earth. It would be a much, a big star, but not nearly as big as we get to see the sun. Um, so it's actually very dark out there, which is part of why it's hard to study. We really need to send spacecraft out there to get good information. And so, here we have a little baby star. Whose very exciting name is HH34. HH34. <laughs> um, it's called a Herbig Haro object, thus the HH. It's a very specific type of star that we see that is young, forming, and emits these really huge jets, which I think is pretty cool. But this is pretty likely what our sun looked like about four billion years ago, four and a half billion years ago. And you'll see a question here that says, how do stars form? Yeah, so what you're seeing here is the very exciting moment uh, at the beginning of a solar system where we had a huge cloud of gas and dust and little tiny things started going together. Something might have happened, like maybe another star blew apart and a shock wave went through, which caused things to start to swirl together. Um, but as more and more gas and dust starts to stick together and make a bigger and bigger ball, um, it starts spinning, which you can sort of imagine have you ever taken two magnets on a table and put them close to each other? As soon as they click together, they spin. So you have a similar thing. Every little piece of material that gets added adds the energy, adds momentum um, to the spinning object. And once it gets big enough, it gets so big, the gravity gets so intense that at the center of this object, atoms, which really try to stay apart from each other, get crushed together. And this is what we call nuclear fusion. And when that happens, you get a nuclear explosion. And so once in the middle of a star, you start having nuclear explosions, that's when a star will actually uh, turn on, if you will. That's when it will become the sort of generator of light and energy and heat. <clears throat> um, and then meanwhile, this is uh, the star started to form. As millions and billions of years pass, other parts of this cloud will clump together into their own little balls and form planets and moons and things like that. I have a lot of people asking, what is that big uh, uh, red disk? And what are those lines coming out of the top and bottom of the star? So, yeah, as the star forms, um, and this is, by the way, we should point out, this is not a photograph. This is a computer-generated model. But it is a real object, and all of this, this image is completely based on things that we actually observe that are happening in HH2. 34. So, yep. It's HH34. <laughs> I'll see if I can pull us a real image from Hubble here real, as oh. you can be talking. So the big red disk around is um, just all of that other gas and dust that's spinning around and starting to clump together and forming planets and things. It's mostly hydrogen and helium. Uh, there's a lot of other elements that will form together and form rock and water and all this stuff. Um, and the jets shooting off, Jose, tell us about those jets shooting out of that protostar. So those jets are an indication that this star actually just started shining. When you talked about nuclear explosions that happen inside stars, you talked about that's when the star starts producing heat, light, and energy. What happens is when that explosion first starts, the star shoots out a bunch of material. Now, stars are magnetic. They have magnetic fields. And their magnetic fields are much, 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 much stronger than the Earth's. They're very powerful. And so those magnetic fields, just like the magnetic fields on the Earth, are weak near the poles. So those magnetic fields take that material that gets shot out of the star and concentrate it at the north and south pole of the star. And then that material gets shot out into space in those big stellar jets right there. And so that's why you have those streaks on the top and the bottom is that's where the magnetic field from the star directed that burst of material when the star started, started shining. All right, and we have an image fading in here. So this is actually a real image of the object. I'm gonna shrink it down 
just a little bit if I can here. Um, it is, this is an image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. This is actually in the Orion Nebula, which is our closest stellar nursery, about 1500 light years away. And so you can see the image isn't quite as impressive. We don't have as much detail, but you can see that huge jet coming off of it um, down and to the left. So this is what we actually see of the object. And then a scientist put together a visualization using scientific data from images like this and other data and then gave that to us in this program called Uniview, which is pretty exciting. I see a question here in the chat that says, how is this baby star different than the stars we can see from Earth that make up constellations like the Big Dipper? So this star is just fainter and smaller. Uh, stars we see in the night sky vary in brightness because of distance and size. So some of them are big blue stars that are young stars that have formed. Um, but they're typically further on in their growth. We're looking at a toddler star, basically. Those would be teenagers and adults. Um, we're pretty solidly middle age, 40 or so years old, if you were a human, our son is. Um, this one would be about a 10 year old. Um, and some of the stars we see in the night sky are like parents to grandparents age. And they're just different parts in their life and different sizes. And a lot of the, the brighter stars you see in the night sky, like the stars that make up the constellations, those stars are much, much bigger than our sun. Uh, most of the, the stars that are the size of our sun are actually too dim to see without a telescope in the night sky, unless they're close enough. Um, but most of the stars that make up the constellations are really, really big, really bright stars. So I see a question, a couple questions here that uh, people want to know how long does this star or do stars usually shine? How long, do, how long is the life of a star? That's a great question. There's a, there's a big variation depending on the star. Um, our sun, we expect to burn for about 10 billion years, um, which we're about halfway through. So 5 billion years, which is a really long time. Um, and that's a pretty stable star. Cooler, smaller stars will last for much longer. Brighter, really hot, active stars will burn out more quickly. Um, but then it gets even more confusing because you might have a huge red supergiant and it'll burn out and it'll explode and it'll be a supernova and it might leave behind, or might leave behind a black hole, but it also might leave behind a neutron star, which is a very hot, dense star um, that will last for a long time. So it's complicated is the answer to that. <laughs> yeah, we're still studying stars. And as we use our telescopes, we are fortunate because all of the stars that we observe are different ages. So we're able to observe baby stars like this. We're able to observe sort of middle-aged stars like our sun. We're able to observe older stars. We can see big stars, small stars, hot stars, cool stars. And as we study these stars, uh, what we do as scientists is we share this information with each other. We have other scientists check our work that's called peer review. And so we can start to come up with a big idea that encompasses stars. And that's what a theory is. So we use this theory uh, to talk about how stars form, how they live, how they die. And what, when we say die, what we mean is that the, sun, the star runs out of fuel. So what stars do is they take hydrogen and crush it in their cores into more complicated elements like helium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. And the more m stuff a star is made out of, the more mass it has, the more gravity it has. So it can make more complicated elements. Because it has more gravity and makes more complicated elements, it also tends to be hotter. So uh, that's sort of the the way that we learn about stars is still learning about stars. We're still learning about them, still studying. And you someday can, can make some breakthrough discovery about stars. You might find a star out there that nobody's ever seen before. The sky is filled with stars. And you have to give us some time because stars have been around for probably somewhere between 12 and 14 billion years. Um, wait, more than that. Uh, no, you're right, you're good. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. They keep updating the age of the universe on me. Um, <clears throat> whereas we have only been like, only had telescopes for like 400 years. So we've got a lot of time to catch up on stellar lifespans. I see a question in the chat too that says, why are there so many moons in our solar system, but only one star is bright and hot enough to be a sun? And then I saw another question earlier about why do some things in the disk form planets and why do things form stars? And so when we say a star, these are great questions. 
These, yeah. these objects all form in the same way of material clumping together. But in the case of stars, they have enough stuff and enough gravity that they can fuse, that they can crush hydrogen into more complicated elements. Even though the center of the Earth is really hot and the center of Jupiter is probably really hot, they don't have enough material or enough gravity to crush those elements and have that nuclear fusion. So that's what sets stars apart from moons and planets. They have so much mass, so much material, they have enough gravity to fuse hydrogen at their cores, and that's what makes them stars. And you know what's interesting is in our solar system, there's only, there was only one clump big enough to become a star, but actually as we look out at more and more stars, that's kind of unusual. It's more common for a cloud of dust to form two stars that are orbiting each other, or even three, even more. And sometimes there are, we call those binary star systems. So in the center of a binary solar system, you'd have two stars circling each other and then planets circling those double stars, um, which would be a harder place to live. It's a good thing we only have one star. It leaves a much less variation in temperatures and conditions much nicer. You may have seen a certain famous movie where a young boy named Luke lives on a planet orbiting two stars and sees two stars in the sky. Um, that would be a tough place to live. It's much nicer on Earth. I see a question here that has uh, actually popped up a couple times that says, what object on Earth is closest in size to this baby star? Oh. And so I was trying to find that. Unfortunately, Estimating size is really, really hard in astronomy. Uh, it depends on, we need to know exactly how far away it is, which in and of itself is a hard task to do. And then we look at how much uh, space it takes up in a picture. So I can tell you how many pixels across it was in that old photo, <laughs> but that's not super helpful. Um, I was trying to find the, the length of the jets because that is really, really impressive. Um, those jets stretch out longer than, way longer than our solar system. Um, but I can't find the size of the star except for how many pixels in an image it was. So uh, <laughs> this is one of the hard things with astronomy. To give you an idea of the difficulty, a star I studied when I was in school and I did my thesis on we said it was somewhere between 200 and 700 light years away from Earth. So not very accurate because it, we're looking at how it wobbles. And if we can't see the wobble of how it moves, we can't turn the distance and we can't figure out the size. And that makes science really exciting and really fun to unlock all these mysteries and piece all those things together. I see a question here too that says, do stars orbit? Do stars orbit? So yes. yes. Um, and in a binary star system, the stars orbit each other. Um, in our solar system, everything's going around the sun, but if you zoom out and you look at our solar system, the whole thing is spinning around the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So all of the stars in the Milky Way galaxy are also spinning around. Um, and just like our solar system, the very most, the most massive thing, the thing with the most gravity is at the center. And in our solar system, that is a super massive black hole as well as a lot of stars. We're actually orbiting around the combined gravitational pull of everything farther in than us. You know, looking at the time, why don't we take a look at our whole solar system and see where the sun, or our whole galaxy, see where the sun is so we can show how it orbits maybe to end and get a big perspective. Yay. Yeah, we've got about five minutes left. So I think that's a great idea. We'll zoom out and look at the Milky Way if you have uh, any uh, last minute questions, we'll try to get to those. Go ahead and uh, post that in the chat. I see a quick question here that says, can stars be different shapes? Stars uh, tend to be round like a ball. And that's because of gravity. Gravity is pulling in the stuff of the star from all different directions and that causes it to be round like a ball. That's also why the earth is round like a ball and our moon is around like a ball. Now there are some things in space that don't have enough gravity for their gravity to shape them into a ball, like that moon of Mars Phobos looks like a gigantic flying potato. Um, but once you hit a certain amount of mass or stuff, then things look, uh, become round like a ball. And then I see a question here that says, why is the Milky Way called the Milky Way? And that is a great question. And remember how I said a long time ago, people said that Roman names uh, were the best and that's what they call the Milky Way if you can get away if you don't live in a city or if you can get away from a city 
to see the Milky Way in the night sky, it does kind of look maybe like spilled milk. So they called it the Milky Way. Other cultures have called it a silver river or a silver road. Um, some people have called it a ladder. So there have been lots of different names for it, but they took the one for the, the Roman one, Milky Way. And that Galactose is actually also where we get the word galaxy from. Um, and it's also the lactose part of milk. So that's another Roman connection right there. Uh, and here we are at the Milky Way. Yeah. So I said in the center there was a super massive black hole, but if you look in the center, it's super bright. Um, <clears throat> black holes, you can't see them. Uh, they don't, they're really hard to see. But as you get closer to the center of the Milky Way, the stars are closer and closer together. So what looks like a giant disc shaped star in the middle is just really billions and billions and billions of stars really close together. So from this distance, they look to look like just one super bright glow. I see some questions about um, uh, what's that spiky red thing? <laughs> ah, that spiky red thing. So Naomi, to help us figure out where we are in the Milky Way, um, turned on a map of all the constellations. And when you're from Earth and you look at the constellations, they make all those pictures, like some of them look like a lion or a scorpion with a little imagination or a hunter. Um, <clears throat> but if you look at them from any other direction, they change shape. So when we zoom out, it looks like all of them are, are a spiky ball pointing in at the earth. <clears throat> um, and so, but that spiky little red ball shows us where we are in the Milky Way, which is out on that outer spiral arm. And it's a good thing we're out there because when you get closer to that center, those stars put off a lot of radiation and the radiation gets so intense, the closer in, it'd be much harder for us to live there. So we're in a really nice spot. We're in a really nice spot in our solar system and our solar system is in a really nice spot in the galaxy. We really got lucky with this uh, blue world. <clears throat> All right, we've got about two minutes left. I see uh, some questions here about how, how we had got this image. Um, is this an actual picture? So this is not an actual picture. We've never sent anything anywhere near far enough away to look back and take this picture. So we can measure the distances to all, more or less with some degree of accuracy, the distances to all the stars we can see in the night sky. And then we can also see beyond. If you see all these colored dots beyond the Milky Way galaxy, those are all other galaxies. Um, and when we look at other galaxies, they don't come in very many different shapes. Um, they come in spirals and whirlpools and irregular, which is kind of a catch-all cat category. Um, but based on all the stars we can measure accurately and the shapes of galaxies, we are pretty confident this is what our galaxy looks like. Um, but some of them is filled in because it's very hard to see from where we are through, we call it the galactic bulge, that really bright part in the center. It's really hard to see anything through there except for a couple little spots. Um, so we have to kind of extrapolate what the stars look like on that side. And uh, some people want to know where is the where is our solar system? Where is our sun in this picture of the? So if you see those little, there's just a few little red lines up there, um, but that little clump of red on the top of the screen is where our solar system is, and it's swirling around, um, swirling around the Milky Way. We're moving sideways at about fifty thousand miles an hour around the Milky Way galaxy. Um, and it takes about 250 million years to make a full circle around the center of the Milky Way galaxy. That's a long time. All right, we are, we are at the end of our tour of the universe today. Naomi, perhaps you would be so kind as to fly us home to Earth. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to everybody's questions, but you guys had some really, really great questions. I hope you learned a lot. Big round of applause to Mitch and Naomi. Thank you so much for being our host and our pilot. I and really thank appreciate you such a fun that. audience. And yes, thank you so much uh, for joining us for this tour of the universe. I've been your moderator, Jose. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you so much for sticking with the museum uh, and, uh, and uh, joining us this evening. I really appreciate it. And I hope everybody has a good night tonight. Thank you, everybody.